Good morning and a very happy Sabbath to all of you. Uh, it's wonderful to be here together again as we uh, worship God, as we contemplate His Word. And uh, I believe you'll enjoy the topic this morning. It is, it is an important one. And uh, I hope that we uh, have your attention and uh, that you will be blessed by it. And uh, in so doing, God will be on it. Uh, can I invite you just to bow your heads? Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the means by which we can communicate, that we can share your word and uh, how wonderful indeed it is. And it gives us the insurance that you are a God who is in control. Lord, help us never to lose courage, but to know who you are and what you are, a loving, good and, and wonderful Father. So help us now. Open our minds and our hearts in Jesus' precious name. Amen. The title, God on Trial, is a precarious one. But then again, when you think of it, God has been accused many times. You know, people, some people still do. That God is unfair. And the reality is that whatever is happening around us or what we can see and, and especially what we don't and cannot see or haven't seen. It all serves one purpose. To make known to us that God could never be on trial. God is good all the time. God is just all the time. And yes, God is even loving all the time, even if he executes judgment. I hope it helps you to understand where we are in time and uh, where we live and why we live where we live. And so, um, God on trial, I mean, I could give it a subtitle, Adam and Eve and the fall. Uh, that's where it all started. And then we need to look at this to bring it where we really are in our study from the Word of God, which is really the third chapter of the book of Genesis. When you consider this, is there an indictment that means an accusation that might stick? Uh, is there a charge that you could levy against God for the origin of sin? You know, God did allow it. Yeah, we know that because God could have stopped Eve and he could have stopped Adam. He could have barred Satan from even getting near this planet. And yet he didn't. The core value of the whole truth is that God wants to be loved for who he is and not for the fear that you might hold for him. And that's important. There's a big difference. Jesus said it like this. He said, if you love me, you keep my commandments. So commandment keeping must be based on love for God. If you can hang on to that principle, that will be very good. Let me repeat that. Commandment keeping is actually a response, a love response to God for who he is. That is the relationship that God is looking for. Not one based on fear, fear of punishment, that is. Now, now have a look at this, have a look at this. The origin of sin, why did God allow this? For the very reason we just explained this. Did God foreknew that this would happen, that Adam and Eve would fall, that, that uh, in fact prior to that, much prior to that, that in heaven at one day the angelic host, there would be an angel, and he knew exactly which one would rebel, and one third of the angels would see it, the rebel's way, today's demon. It's an incredible thing to go through, isn't it? But God is going through all of this. And I think you want to see his role in this great controversy. And it is incredible. How sin entered the world in the first place. From a world of happiness, love and perfection, to one of sorrow, hatred, suffering and wickedness. And such is the record in Genesis chapter 3. Often dismissed as just a story. But the principles outlined in, in chapter 3 are enormous, not to be dismissed, to be studied, 
and taken into account. We live in a pandemic, we know that. Horrendous what it does to this planet, isn't it? It's horrendous what it does to people's lives. Wrecks it, ruins it. Even if you're not directly infected, you are still affected because, because of the ramifications that it has, economically particularly. So much suffering. So much suffering in a world where we have warfare, where we have a maldistribution of resources, where we have obscene uh, uh, famines. Terrible. All due to sin. So what is sin? What is the original sin? In defense of God, I'd like to put this straight away. Not that God needs defending, but we're just reasoning here. In defense of God, I would say that sin originated as an act of free will. You can't say that God did not allow a free will. Now, people say this. I have a free will and I do what I want. Those who claim that often do not have a free will at all. In fact, can I put it to you this way, the way I see it personally? I never claim that I have a free will. But I have a freedom where I place my will. Can you see the difference? I can choose to give my will to God. And that means I can enter into his service, into the knowledge of God, into a relationship, and I let him have my will because I trust my will with him a lot more than I trust it being with myself because normally someone steals it away from me and it goes to the other side. So there is a fine understanding here. A freedom of choice is not the same as the freedom of will. Those who say that I can manage, control, and choose, and handle my own free will, often are the obvious ones. When observed, you can see they cannot control their will. It is not the free will they claim they have. Our will is controlled either way, by good or by evil. And my recommendation is that you give it to the one who is good and the only one that is good. Does that make sense to you? Sin originated as an act of free will. Now, Adam and Eve had a free will. There was, there was no sinful propensity. They had the capacity, the absolute full capacity to obey. Something you and I lost. Because they lost it. And you can't pass on to your posterity that which you do not possess yourself. But they had a free will. But that doesn't stop you from sinning. Against the revealed command of God. It's not as if they didn't know the command of God. It was revealed. There is no excuse. This was not down to God. You could not blame God. He had not placed a prohibition that was difficult. He had not demanded a certain exercise that was enormously difficult. No, not at all. It was simplicity. It was about one thing. Loyalty. Loyalty to God. To love him is to obey him. Right? Yes. Now, what is sin? Well, sin, of course, is the breaking of the law. So, we normally think of what it does do. Well, sin kills. It's like pesticides. It kills. Sin kills. It kills your relationship with God. It comes between you and God. Isaiah 59, verse 2, is a Brilliant verse. You, you, you look that up. Isaiah 59, verse 2. Terrible. The distance it can put between us and God. So how did it get here? And we have to turn to Genesis to learn. God created a perfect world. Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was what? Very good. Now the Hebrew tov me'ot means... Indeed, just very good. In this setting, in this context, it means perfection. There are other words for perfection, but this would be having the connotation of perfection. Um, remember Jesus. Jesus um, was approached by a rich young ruler. He turned to Jesus and he said to him, uh, 
a good teacher. He, you know, he knelt before him, daylight as well, you know, in front of everybody else. He, he was well on his way to be close to, to Jesus. And, and, and he called him good teacher. And Jesus picked him up on that. He said, why do you call me good? Only one is good. And they all knew the answer. Only God is good. Is God perfect? Oh, absolutely. So the meaning tov can mean, depending on the setting, the context, it can mean perfection. And I put it to you in the context of what God had created here. Every day he saw it was good. Then collectively he looked at it on day six and it was what? It was very good. Very good. Perfect. 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 Now, Genesis 3, 31. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden, according to Genesis 2, verse 9. So we have two trees in the middle of the garden. The tree of life, and we have the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You know, they were both in the middle of the garden. Separate. So there's two separate choices. But isn't it amazing how close the two choices are? You pick the wrong one, you only go one way. You pick the other one, and God will take care of you. And you have a wonderful future. That's still true today. It's almost as if today still there is, a, there is this magnificent choice, very close together. Either you follow him or you don't. Who do you give your will? <coughs> now, let's have a look at this. The Lord God commanded the man... And he said this, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. Now, God said what? Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. In other words, when those trees were placed there right at the beginning, there was already a great controversy between good and evil. Because if there would have been no evil anywhere in the universe, why have the tree of knowledge of good and evil? No need. Clearly, a rebellion had already found place in heaven. Clearly, an expulsion of the rebels had been found place before the creation of this planet. And everything about the third chapter of the book of Genesis points to that. There is one who invades with his poison this planet and seduces man into disobedience, as he did with the angels, and even with himself for that matter. That rebellion, that controversy had already found place in heaven. And Satan was expelled, and so were his angels with him who saw it his way. I think you should know that. You should understand, and it's apparent from the whole of the chapter, that the enemy of souls was already very active. And he was obviously already cast out of heaven. He was expelled. For in the day that you eat of it, and this is interesting, you will surely die. In the Hebrew, you don't put it quite in those words, but the translation is good. It really means dying, you will die. That means you certainly will die, and that would indicate a process of dying. It doesn't indicate you drop dead, but you will be dying and dying, and for sure. And that is what it means in the Hebrew. And we knew that uh, it took uh, hundreds of years. There's a covenant. What's a covenant? Covenant is an agreement. A covenant. And the covenant is simple, obey and live. All Adam and Eve had to do is to stay loyal to God. It was a simple minor test of loyalty. Had they stuck to that, they would have had eternal life. There was the tree of life, all they had to do, partake of the tree of life, and they would live forever and ever. And they would be justified. God would be justified to guarantee them that. But they were on probation. They were well informed, by the way. 
and that becomes also very plain of the story that we are going to look at as it unfolds. The covenant is obey and leave. You know, the Bible talks about two covenants, and you say, well, what are the two covenants? What's the difference? Now, the first covenant is obey and leave. Obey and leave. The second covenant, the second covenant is obey and leave. You say, but pastor, they're the same. Yeah, true. In this instance, Adam and Eve could have obeyed and lived. You know, when the Israelites came out of Egypt, they were standing there around uh, Mount, uh, Mount uh, Sinai, Mount Horeb. And God spoke the law and they, 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 their ears were, oh, they were so afraid of the voice of God, they said to Moses, can you please tell God not to speak to us? Let him speak to you. You, you, you tell us what God wants us to do and we will do everything that God said we should do. They meant that. A few weeks later, they're dancing around the golden calf. They did. They couldn't do it. They just couldn't do it. You and I cannot obey of ourselves. Adam and Eve could, didn't. They would like to, can't. But through a relationship with Christ, who earned the right to enable us to obey, we can. That's the Christian religion. As simple as that. And so, let's look at it. Let's look at it. So God created man in his own image. That's wonderful. Man has this, man has this exquisite origin. Made in the image of God. I know it's hard to tell sometimes, particularly <laughs> maybe with some of the rest. But yeah, the Bible says we were made in the image of God. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, equal. He created them, and they were both naked. I like this one. Look at, look at this. You know when you see the pictures of Adam and Eve, there's always a lot of bushes and leaves to cover them as he walks through the garden. Because, you know, you can't have pictures of naked men and women. The word arum is very interesting. It's, it's, a, it's a fascinating word. The word arom here, naked, the word arom means naked, but not doesn't mean necessarily not being covered. I'm going to put it to you, again from the story, that Adam and Eve were covered. Not with a linen cotton garment, as we know it, woolen, whatever. No, no, no. They were covered with a uh, with a robe of, beautiful white robe of whatever the substance is. I don't know. It doesn't exist today on this planet. They had a raiment of white covering them. And that would be beautiful. By the way, that's the same raiment of white, you might be interested, that is the same raiment of white that angels wear. The, you know, the, the, the rightful angels. And it will be the same raiment that you will be wearing when you're up there as a redeemed, when you come up in the first resurrection. It's nice to know. It's good to know what you will be wearing. And it's the robe of righteousness, which is a gift from God. So the word arom here does not exclude the white raiment of covering that they obviously had. The man and his wife, they were not ashamed. Why were they not ashamed? They certainly were not ashamed for their private parts as perhaps today you would. That would not be applicable. The, the, the reason why they were not ashamed is because they had that raiment of white covering them. That raiment of righteousness. And so, Genesis 3 verse 1. Here it starts. Now the serpent was more cunning. And there you have that word again. Slightly different uh, voweling, but Arum, the same word, which means naked. Now, nakedness, the connotation of nakedness in the Bible, and you get that from uh, the, the letter to the Laodicean church, you don't know that you're poor, blind, and naked, meaning sinful. Nakedness is now, because of this story, is now connected or has the connotation of nakedness. Arum here is a negative connotation. The serpent was more cunning. Now, 
I could never understand how there could be a serpent right there in the garden, in a creation, where God had said about it was very good. Let's, let's, let's look at this. Let's look at this. More cunning was, but here is the interesting part. There's always so much to learn. The Old Testament was written in the Hebrew. In the Hebrew, you don't have the present verb of to be. It doesn't exist. But the past tense does, was. That word is haya. That word haya also means became. Depends on the setting. Depends on the context. I want you to hang on to that. I could say the serpent became more cunning. How could a serpent become more cunning? The negative, the underhandedness of a room, the underhandedness of a slyness, the imperfection, certainly from a moral point of view. Are we talking about an animal anyway? How could an animal become like that? Become more cunning? And that is where the key is in the translation. It could happen, for example, if someone possessed the serpent. Now, when we read serpent, we always think in terms of a snake. I don't know why that is. Because later on, there is a, there is a curse where this animal is going to crawl on its belly and eat dust. We'll come to that in a minute. What is important is that this animal, a serpent, the, the, the word nachas in Hebrew uh, means serpent, it means snake, it means uh, dragon, it means many things. Depends on the setting again. But there is, there is paleontological evidence that there were flying serpents. Uh, this could have been the most magni magnificent animal. In fact, in fact, you know, I would recommend that if you haven't got this book, Patriarchs and Prophets, you get it. You read the early chapters, and you look at the description of the events that you and I are studying here. You find it fascinating. I highly recommend it. A book written by Alan G. White. And so we have a magnificent, beautiful animal becoming cunning, even though, even though God had said uh, uh, everything that he had made was indeed very good. Remember the words? Tov miot. But that's how it changed. Because someone possessed the serpent, which is what God had permitted. How do I know that someone was permitted to, to come into the serpent so it became crafty, underhanded, a negative connotation? Well, it's now speaking. It's now speaking. Satan, in possessing the serpent, is utilizing the vocal cord of the animal, expressing an abstract thought, a moral issue, entering into a dialogue. Now, now, I know that you don't do that with your animals at home, for one good reason. They can't speak. They certainly cannot comprehend the moral issues that you and I are dealing with. Well, neither could that serpent. It wasn't the serpent, it was the one who possessed the serpent. Has God indeed said, now notice, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. He is now finding Satan, he is hiding himself. Why didn't he appear as a beautiful angel of light? He could, he was, he didn't. Why not? Because Adam and Eve were forewarned about him. So he disguises himself. He is clearly intimating to the woman that the serpent, who no doubt would have been at the tree of knowledge of good and evil, would have no doubt tried to intimate that it had consumed the fruit and had been lifted to a higher plane of living, such as a capacity to speak, such as a capacity to reason about moral issues, and claiming a higher knowledge 
about God than her. That's what is happening. Notice. The question is translated in English. You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. But that's the interesting part. In the Hebrew, the literal translation goes like this. You shall not eat of any tree of the garden. That is what he's saying. Has God said, eat of any tree in the garden? No, that wasn't true. And she knew that, and she took the bait. What she should have done is turn around, walk away. Clearly, she must have been on her own, because later on, Adam joins. Satan had waited for this moment. And he did it so craftily. He did it so cleverly. You know, we know Matt's from Satan. But the one thing that can keep us on the straight and narrow is an absolute belief and trust in the word of God and know the word of God. That can keep you safe. It can. Now, she bites. She certainly does. And she gives, she enters into a dialogue. And it's all about the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And she said, well, God has said, you shall not eat it. True. That is correct. She's right. You shall not touch it. God hadn't said that. And I would recommend that you get that book I was talking about. Patriarchs and Prophets. She said, that he had somehow, the serpent, put the fruit, whatever the fruit was, we don't know. The fruit would have been perfectly all right. Nothing wrong with the fruit, as you will see. It was just forbidden fruit. That he actually had placed it in her hand and was suggesting she had touched it. But nothing happened to her. She would be all right to eat it. Read that book. I, I commend to you that you do that. You shall not touch it, lest you die. She said, you will die. Not as emphatic as God had said it, but she did, did understand what God said. Now, here comes line number one. Satan is the father of all lies. Where do lies come from? Satan. You got it. First lie. You won't die. Well, that's a lie because she's dead. She did die. Okay. Here's another one coming up. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. What he's saying, what he is saying, God is God and he doesn't want competition. He doesn't want you to be like God. What he is saying to the woman, I have been upgraded. Look at me. Listen to me. How about you if you eat of it? What might become of you? And this is what he is enticing her to do. You will be like God. That is, that is line number two. By eating, she did not become like God. There are experiences God doesn't want you to have and you shouldn't have because if you do have them, it's only an encumbrance to your salvation. And it certainly doesn't make you look like God, feel like God, act like God. She never became like God. Far from it. Line number two. Then he said, knowing good and evil. There's line number three. Definitely another lie. What did she do after she had partaken? You know the story. So when her hubby, when her husband is with her, she gets him to eat as well. Was that a good thing? Well, she thought so. But it wasn't. She doesn't understand the difference between good and evil. Only the word of God can give you that. So the woman, notice, this, this is important. And this is the... The texts are asked to be read because I think in here we can find there's a bit of Eve in all of us. Maybe still, come on, but people. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, what is she doing? She is now judging by her own assessment. We all have that inclination and it's not clever. 
So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it, it no doubt was, that it was pleasant to the eyes, looked all right, pleasant to the eyes, and uh, a tree desirable to make one wise. She desired to be wise. But she was already wise before she ate. She lost her wisdom when she did eat. Contrary to the promise that was held out by the serpent who said, oh, you'll be like God. Desirable to make one wise. When we desire something that God has not given us, we make the same mistake as Eve, as Eve of old. We do, we do. So she took of its fruit and she ate. She did. Sin is transgression of the law. Obey and live. You know, you shall have no other gods before me. That's what God said. Have a look at this one. You shall not kill. You, you, you shall not steal. Uh, you shall not covet. Look at 1, 6, 8, and 10. There are four commandments here that she broke. She didn't listen to God anymore. She was listening to another God who directed her. That's the first commandment she broke. Eating from the forbidden fruit would kill her, and it did. But not only that, she also became a killer, a, a collaborator with Satan, because she got her husband to eat as well. So she certainly transgressed in more ways than one that commandment that we know as commandment number six. You shall not steal. That tree belonged to God. God said it's off limits. It wasn't hers to take. When we take something that belongs to God and it doesn't belong to us, we're stealing whatever it is in whatever form it comes. You shall not covet. Coveting is the most common, I suppose. Jealousy. Coveting. Desiring something that you don't have. And in fact, in fact, desiring to hang on to what you have is another form of coveting too. She broke at least four commandments. That's what she did do. And by the way, I know I use the apple because everybody talks about an apple. It's not. We don't know the fruit. But this is just an illustration. She also gave to her husband Visser. Now, her husband is Visser, and he is drawn into that. And if you read that book, Patriarchs and Prophets, if you read how she enticed him the emotions that played a role in his mind. He loved her, and he thought he was now having to be separated from her. He couldn't bear the thought, and he put her before God. He put the gift that she was from God, he put the gift of God before the giver, God himself. That's idolatry. It comes in many ways, doesn't it? So often happens. But we never should put a person before God, no matter how much we love them. And the eyes of them were opened, wrote this, and they knew they were naked. Now the word Yadam means the experience. They experienced a nakedness. They hadn't had that before. Because now they are naked, and that's that word again, Aron. And they sewed fig leaves together, fig leaves, and made themselves coverings. Now, of course, fig leaves never will do. The raiment of light is the superior garment, the garment of righteousness, which is a gift. And for every single Christian that has been redeemed, it is the gift of redemption. It is the gift of Christ, his righteousness, that will cover us. They lost that. They lost that. It was the fact that that raiment of light, that they were in that sense naked, that ashamed them and made them hid from God. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day that would have been in the evening. Where are you? It's the voice of God. Have you ever heard the voice of God? Where are you? You know when you have strayed? Somewhere in your mind you hear it. Where are you? Where have you gone to? And why have you? That's the voice. And then there's the confession up to a point. But there's not really a confession. 
Adam and his wife had hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God. Why? Because they knew they were naked. Among the tree in the garden. Now, did God know where they were? Yes. Yes. But they hid. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. What an excuse. What an excuse. But that's what he did. Then the voice comes and God, and this would be the person of Christ, trying to draw the confession of man for his own good. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And then he said this, uh, who told you that you were naked and have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you should not eat from? Uh, then look at the answer. If you consider the reason why he gave in and ate, because he wanted to share his faith with the woman, the one that he really loved, he did. And now he starts blaming the woman. Notice, not what he does. See the character change, the tremendous change of character. The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave and me of this thing. I love this painting. Look at the man. He is saying, it's not my fault, <laughs> her fault. Oh, uh, and your fault, because you gave her to me. She is troubled. What a ridiculous excuse. And I ate. She didn't hold his hand behind his back. She didn't force him. I ate. There it is. The woman is no better. What is this you have done? God is now turning to the woman. Not my fault. The serpent deceived me. And that's true. Paul recognized that in his letter to Timothy, he said the woman was deceived. But being deceived is no excuse for sinning if you have the, if you have the truth of God is in your reach. You will not be judged by, for being deceived. You will only be judged for not accepting and living the truth. You have to choose the truth. That's why it is there. The serpent deceived me and I ate. And of course, who made the serpent? <laughs> you did. Curse number one. Because you have done this, is God speaking to the serpent? Well, he's really speaking to the one who's possessing the serpent. You understand that. You were cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, you shall eat dust. In other words, you will crawl. You don't have dust for diet. It is, a, it is a, an expression that he will be over the ground. No higher than that. And it's interesting that therefore prior to this a snake in the form of the animal that crawls over the ground was most likely not there at all because this serpent would have had a capacity of most likely flight, would have been a beautiful animal, but now things are changing by way of the introduction of a curse that he will go on his belly. And so due to mutations, this animal, of course, lost the capacity physically that he had before. A reminder to mankind all the days of your life. Notice. The text that comes up now is fantastic. I will put enmity between you and the woman. I love you to understand this. Who will put the enmity between you and the woman? Who is God speaking to? The serpent who possesses, or the, the Satan who possesses the serpent. That's the one that's being addressed. Satan hears for the first time something that he had not counted on. He didn't count on this. God is not giving up on his creation. He is not giving up on mankind. He never has. Or will. And then he hears this. Between your seed and her seed. The only one who can put the enmity between man and Satan is God because of himself, man cannot have enmity with Satan because he is a fallen, sinful being. But God can put the enmity there. And the enmity that he can put there is giving you the capacity of the choice where you will place your will. 
You have to be willing to surrender your will to him. You surrender your will to him, and he will take it and form it and shape it and empower it. So it's between your seed, those who will follow you, and her seed. Now her seed becomes personified, and it has to be a messianic, because look at this. He shall cross your head. Not just bruise. Now it's stronger in the Hebrew. Crush. He will crush your head. The word for head is ros. Rose also means poison. He will crush your poison. To crush someone's head is a, is a deadly affliction and defeat. He, he did that as well. And you shall crush his heel. That's an expression of a cowardly attack, which was culminated there at Calvary, when Satan, by inducing, by inducing people to afflict the cruelty on the Son of Man to the degree that he did, which was for the whole universe to see. It was the most cowardly attack on the one who created him. And the crossing of the heel bones may be envisaged as the single nail was driven through both of the heel bones as they twisted the knees and drove it through those feet. And the cruelty would have been enormous, indescribable pain of the torture of crucifixion. That is fulfilled as well. And so, I want to take you to I will put the enmity, the greatest promise ever. I will sprinkle clean, and I take this from Ezekiel 36, I will sprinkle clean water on you. That's particularly in the case of the, of the sacrifice of the red heifer, which is the one that best personifies actually Calvary, that the, the, the water that was ultimately uh, with the burnt uh, residue was sprinkled on the people and towards the city. I will sprinkle clean water on you means, it really means uh, there is the gift of the Spirit, the water, uh, there is the, the merits of Christ that is afforded to you. That is what it means. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean. It is powerful. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness, not just some, all of it. God can do all of it and he will do all of it if you let him. And from all your idols, whatever was there or is there, he can get rid of it for you. He can get rid of it for you. I will give you a new heart. Now, a new heart is a new mind. In the Hebrew, it's really the mind. You know, a, a new mind, a new moral taste, a new outlook of life. That's what you would like to be, but never can be, because somehow you can't let go of whatever it stops you from being that. He says, I can do it for you. But you got to let me. I'll give you a new heart. I'll put a new spirit within you. A new spirit that only he can give. What we need is not an improvement. What we need is a regeneration, a recreation. That is what we need. He said, I can give that to you. I will make the heart of stone out of your flesh. The heart of indifference, the heart that says, I can't love. Yes, you can. He gives you a heart of flesh, which is a heart of response. And you yield to him. I'll give you a heart of response. I will put my spirit within you. And if he puts his spirit within you, he will cause you to walk in his statues. Why do you walk in his statues? Because you want to. You want to. And all, you will keep all my judgments. You'll keep all my judgments. And you will do them. You will. Don't say, I can't. I know you can't. <laughs> With him, you can. And should. That's life. That's true living. And that is what he's given us. He will put the enmity there. Curse number two. The ground for your sake Thorns and thistles, thorns in the Hebrew. Mindset is synonymous, of course, with sin, and that's why the crown of thorns was placed on the head of 
Christ, the Roman soldiers were acting out the gospel. The, the crown of thorns, all the sins of the world were placed on his head, on his mind. He offered his mind. You go to Isaiah 53, you will find it. He offered his mind for us. Not just his body. His mind was offered for him because that is the one that tore the life out of him at Calvary because of the incredible separation from the Father. As the sin of the world were placed upon us, upon him. Incredible when you stand still, what happened there? In the sweat of your face, back to Genesis, you shall eat your bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. And that is the truth that we observe in this sinful world. Cursed by sin, we suffer this fate. But it's going to change soon. Very soon. As for Adam and his wife, I like this one. The Lord made tunics of skin. That means an animal had to die and God performed the sacrifice. Indicative of him sacrificing himself. The robe of righteousness is prefigured by the tunics that he made for them by which he closed them. The perfect robe of righteousness is to come. Is to come. That's the promise. And so, defense number one. I already said, the sin originated as an act of free will against the revealed command of God. Defense number two, I'd like to put it to you, God became man and bore the penalty. Here's another one, defense number three, as if he needs an offense still. God allowed it, that is true, uh, but God will restore everything. And because he allowed it, that what he allowed, that which the whole of the universe has been able to observe, that which you and I have experienced, that all of that will be the absolute antidote for rebellion ever, ever, ever to arise another time. And be part of that. I think it's a gift of God to be part of that. I know life is unfair. I know life can be difficult. But if God can use you and give to you the prospect, the reality, his presence, life eternal, I don't know what else could possibly, possibly, interest our minds, occupy our minds more than that. The love of God has been demonstrated. God was profoundly involved in the whole great controversy and he still is. God paid the ultimate price so that you and I can have the ultimate result. And so, when you consider this in closing, what is the finding? There's only one finding. God should never be on trial. Because God has no case to answer. God is good all the time. It would be wonderful to see him, wouldn't it? Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we've been able to think, contemplate, study your word, your love, who you are, what you have done for us. Thank you for the privilege of knowing you. Help us to love you. That we will keep your commandments. Give us your spirit. Take our will. Form it to yours. That our thoughts, our longings, our deeds will be in harmony, completely and totally and utterly with yours. Bless each and every one, right here, everyone who hears this sermon. Keep them safe, keep them well, keep them strong. Jesus is coming. It's but a short time. And we must hold on. And what a joy it will be to be reunited again. And so bless us now, in Jesus' most precious name. Amen.